there. Um, we're here with Greg now, so we just had a learning yard day with um, basically the content creators, things like that. Before we get into that, I just want, if you wouldn't mind, for people that don't know Greg, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Greg Burns. Uh, my wife and I raised seven kids here at Nature's Image Farm, where our business is bees, uh, selling nukes, queens, and supplies. Uh, one of the important thing to us um, is to be able to serve those that served us. We do a lot of mentoring uh, with Hives for Heroes, but also... Uh, find ways that we can help our local community, our beekeepers. Not that we are experts, not that we have, this is the only way to keep bees, but we share our experience with them uh, and try to give them the tools to be successful as they grow with their beekeeping experience and journey. Um, for us, it's really important to not so much share all the things that we think we did right, but share a lot of the hard lessons learned along the way. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we do here at Nature's Image Farm is we raise bees, um, but more importantly, we're trying to raise good kids, good humans, and help mm -hmm. uh, be the change that we want to see in this world by actually putting our money, um, walking that out in a way to where we're making uh, as much of an impact as we can while we're on God's green earth. Yeah, absolutely, Greg. Um, we've seen a lot of what you do with the stream team on Wednesdays. Um, Major Image Farm and your community, you've been able to build yourself, um, Bruce and Brian. Every Wednesday, we see the impact you guys have on um, so many people as through the comments. No videos and um, as you said mistakes that obviously you know I think the biggest thing um, is to share your mistakes if you know when you make them because guess what every beekeeper is going to make the same mistake no. if if you're not transparent which you save somebody else from that but um, <clears throat> a big thing we, I wanted to get started getting into as far as queens go right now if you wouldn't mind I ask you a couple questions about sure queens absolutely going on um, so here at nature's image farm you talk often about your stock things like that you really like with queens yeah. now if you wouldn't mind just sharing a couple of traits you like to see in your queens right what kind of keeps queens going that you want to see more of and what you don't want to see and you kind of go away from those queens yeah i think uh, as you d start developing a queen breeding program you start um, sorting through uh, colonies that have certain uh, positive or negative attributes mm -hmm. um, year after year you start to tighten that up and you start to funnel and filter what you're seeing uh, from your bees. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for us, one of the most important things is number one, they've got to overwinter, mm -hmm. right? Colonies yeah. that overwinter give us stock and something to have, uh, to have bees to do something again the next mm -hmm. year. I know it sounds simple, um, but they've got to be able to overwinter um, here in our climate in Ohio. And I, we like to try to do that with the least amount of effort, meaning I don't really want to have something that I've got to babysit, that I've got to... Um, uh, put so much time into so there's a few things that we do with our colonies to help ease some of the ebb and flow of our weather mm -hmm. um, putting hive alive fondant on uh, very minimal things like that a lot of that work goes into the genetic side for bees that are a little bit more rugged a little bit oh, yeah. more resilient um, so first and foremost it's overwintering um, outside of that they also mm -hmm. have to be calm and gentle they have to be bees mm -hmm. that are pleasant to work with um, I know there's a, a lot of folks are on the fence either way that uh, mean bees make more honey or this that I, I'm not here to argue um, that one way or the other but what I have found is that if I don't have bees that are calm and easy to work with I can't be making daughters off of those queens and then putting that those genetics out to the public ship them across the country mm -hmm. and have have folks that have bees that are also unpleasant to work with so they've got to be they've got to be gentle they've got to be calm bees that's the second mm -hmm. thing they, they've got to be prolific Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's great if, if bees make it through the winter. It's great if bees are easy to work. But mm -hmm. if they don't actually produce anything, that's kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. So we've got to have them to be also be prolific. Now, there's a, mm -hmm. that, this conversation goes a couple different ways. Well, what are they prolific? What do they, what do they excel at doing? And that could be a little different for everybody. If you uh, are producing a lot of honey, you might be going towards attributes where uh, bees produce tons and tons of honey, mm -hmm. uh, a big honey crop. Um, if you're you, sometimes uh, bees really excel um, as this brood monsters they make lots and lots of brood uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you find a happy medium in between and so for us we try to find this with the sweet spot in between where yes they will make a great honey crop but they're also going to brood do all the things where they can build up to give us the bee numbers to do the things make the splits make the queens build them mm -hmm. up for winter um, Absolutely. Another aspect that's also very important for us is we also have to have bees that have a certain amount of ruggedness to them. They've got to be resilient. We, mm -hmm. they, we, yes, we, we, we monitor for mites and we want to make sure our bees are clean. But as we tune up our program, we're looking for the colonies that need the least amount of that every single mm -hmm. year. 
those are the ones that we breed from. The ones that when we do washes and we find high mites and things like that, we still keep them, but we treat them, we keep them clean so we have the bee numbers as a yield, as an asset. But those aren't the ones that we're grafting from. Those aren't the ones that we're putting out drone uh, colonies out in our mating areas. Mm -hmm. So we are filtering through the best of the best every single year. So in a nutshell, they've got to overwinter. They've got to be easy to work. They've got to be prolific on a yield. And I want bees that are showing some resilience uh, to mites. So that, that is the overall goal is moving them tighter and tighter in all those directions that hopefully at some point those bees need less of us, less of our intervention to keep the viral loads down. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a big thing is, as you said, overwintering. If you don't have bees, you can't pick the stock that you don't right. you don't want. Um, at some point, whether it's like you mentioned, brood, honey, whatever your return is, you know, for for what your goal is, I think that's a good point. Um, depending on your individual goal, you can go with what stock that you pre preferably want. Right now, um, what's the biggest thing you're looking forward to? I know you talked about in the future, or now, or in the future for artificial insemination. Right. What's your biggest thing you're looking yeah. forward for as? A yeah, that, man, we are really excited. You know, we we've been we've been we kind of got into beekeeping early on. Mm -hmm. um, it, it only took us maybe a year, probably just a year, to figure out that, oh my gosh, we're in love with this. Mm -hmm. We're in love with certain aspects of it. Um, and for us, we are really passionate and feel called uh, to try to make a difference with bee genetics. And mm -hmm. doing that, you know, raising three, four hundred colonies and more sometimes, at some point you feel like you get to a genetic bottleneck where, yes, you can make mm -hmm. strides and you can make advancements um, within your stock, but you feel like you can only go so far and you get it to a certain point and then you make 100 or 200 daughters off of that queen you think is doing everything right mm -hmm. and then it all varies and you're thinking well what in the world's going on here you get to a point where it becomes harder and harder to create consistency with some of those genetic lines um, so what we've decided to do my son and i both um, have been uh, trained and we have the equipment mm. to start getting into artificially inseminated queens now we can specifically take the very best of this colony and that colony, the best drones, the best queen mothers, and graft, put those, those genetic um, combinations together mm -hmm. to help accent, number one, the, the traits that we're looking to keep uh, propagating, mm -hmm. um, but number two, really cut off the 10 or 20 years that it would take with open mating year after yeah, year after a, year. Yeah. You know, when, when you think about, think about beekeeping, for instance, you know, However many time, however many seasons you've been beekeeping, you've only done that one entire cycle, mm -hmm. right? If you've had two years beekeeping or five years or ten, you've only had even even as a decade beekeeper, we've yeah. only had ten cycles of mm -hmm. bee. Like think about if you've only had ten times of riding a bike or ten times on shooting a three pointer or ten times of sharpening a knife, you're not going to be very good. Mm -hmm. So that that can be a uh, limiting factor as you're growing mm -hmm. your bee operation is you only have so much experience to gain the feedback from and up here up north mm -hmm. in Ohio we have a limited window where we have you know a, a, a section from November mm -hmm. until March where there's, we're at a stalemate right before mm -hmm. we can get back and you have to freshen up get back on the horse get going again but with artificial insemination we're able to even in the same year mm -hmm. really fast forward f three four five cycles of queens in the same year mm -hmm. by collecting the semen from the drones, inseminating that into queen lines, uh, and then getting that mix out into our, uh, out into the yards, uh, out into our stock. And that's where I think we're going to see a lot of advancements in number. And secondly, this, the, the unintended consequence of that is we're going to be able to, to create consistency and uniformity. Mm -hmm. And where that's valuable is right now a lot of folks choose our queens because they're interested in uh, the Caucasians that we run, mm -hmm. the double Caucasian, and the, the carny mix that we have. It's a beautiful mix. They, they do a great job on making a lot of propolis. They're mm -hmm. rugged. They're resilient. They're usually darker bees. I like that. And that's the direction mm -hmm. that we want to keep going. With artificial insemination, we can keep fine-tuning those attributes so that we can then provide those breeder queens to folks so mm -hmm. they can then create consistency and uniformity using what we've done um, over the 10 mm -hmm. years, that what, the access that we've had to these genetics, they're able to, cat, to, to, to take advantage of all of that work and that timeline, use it as a leverage point mm -hmm. to really catapult and advance 
their queen breeding program mm -hmm. on the backs and the shoulders of the work that we've done previous. That's a big deal. Yeah, I, I think it, it really is a big deal. And I think the biggest thing so to go off of from what we like to see with, then with AI and just you know uh, propel us forward, I think big things with resistant, you know, um, resilience. So I know you like you have a certain stock that you like, but then with someone you know wants to buy that stock in, the resilience helps with what, what they want to do because if you have resilient stock, then depending on what they want to do, they can make some mistakes because right. you don't know how their beekeeping is. That's a good point. So if with some resilience, you can always help the better stock you have helps for more errors as far as beekeepers who maybe aren't as experienced. It's a great point. It, it does. Um, what we've noticed is the, the better and better that we've done with our, with our genetics and mm -hmm. our stock, the more resilient they are. And what yeah. that means to me, re resilience is is when bees are exposed to a situation mm -hmm. um, and they have a built-in buffer where they can continue to withstand more mm -hmm. of that than they have in the past. Yeah. Whether that's food scarcity, whether it's an sure. increase in viral loads, um, whether it's uh, outside pest pressure, whatever that it might be, mm -hmm. building rugged, resilient bees for us is the, when we look to nature for the answers, nature has a built-in resiliency. When you have mm -hmm. a polyculture of diversity, the plant system, the animal system, mm -hmm. all of those kingdoms combined thrive because they have built in diversity. They have resiliency built into those systems. Why aren't we doing that with our bee stock? When we do that with our bee Good. stock, we're creating opportunities where we have a little bit more flexibility. Not that it mm -hmm. isn't, it, it error proofs the system, but we have bees yeah. that maybe can withstand a little more viral pressure mm -hmm. or they can withstand a little bit more food scarcity. Or like with our, with our line, those bees downsize on their own going into the wintertime. They can get mm -hmm. into smaller clusters and they can cruise through the winter in colonies that are so small it's scary. And they just <laughs> sit there and they cruise and they cruise and they cruise. And then the first part of spring, you, you crack open a box and you're thinking, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of bees there. Should I be worried? And they can, mm -hmm. nah. You come back later, you crack the lid, you look inside, and all of a sudden, they've just started to fill the box out, and they boom, 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 boom. Bees that are more in tune with nature's signs it are important. Mm -hmm. Some genetic stock, if it smells or looks or feels like spring, the rocket shipping to the moon, they get caught by the short hairs when the cold weather of spring comes, and oh, it sets yeah. them back tremendously. Cuts them right off at the legs, and then... Now, and it takes oh. so long. They're dragging out mm -hmm. the dead brood. All of the resources they used to raise mm -hmm. the brood was all a now a waste. So what's interesting, I, what I feel is important um, about our Appalachian mutt line is it's a blend of not only Caucasian and Carney, but also what is thriving here mm -hmm. in these trees too. Today we talked a little yeah. bit about it in the learning yard and why a couple mm -hmm. of these colonies are really special. We're blending those. Mm -hmm. We're not the type of, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we, you've heard the story where uh, our buddy Bruce Jenny at Bruce's Bees mm -hmm. had some bees that had a little bit of characteristic to them. As he would say, mm -hmm. we're a little chippy. And uh, in joking, we're behind the barn here catching queens to take down for them. And we make a little video and we're just joking, mm -hmm. saying, Bruce, we're going to mark these Pepto-Bismol pink to help cool off your spicy girls. Um, and, I, and I think Bruce has seen some results with mm -hmm. that. Uh, that's, that. It's important to be able to, and within a breeding program, is it's one thing if we think we see what we see with our bees. Mm -hmm. But when we can send those queens and ship them across the country, and then other folks are seeing those same things, That's what that confirms mm -hmm. what we're doing, and that's the direction we want to keep going. Um, and so that's, that's why artificial insemination for us is the next mm -hmm. step. We can keep, thing, keep a finer-tuned uh, genetic line with our bees, and I'm really excited uh, to get that out and make mm -hmm. those available for folks coming up in, in 2024. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And so as we wrap this up, I just want to say appreciate for for the con the convergence, the learning yard, first time in the learning yard. It's You got something great going on here. Thank you. And I just wish I wasn't so far away. Yeah. Now, to put you on the spot, so I, I, I appreciate exactly everything you're doing here yeah. and everything you're doing with your line. So as far as artificial insemination, not to put you on the spot, yeah. how open are you to having somebody come let's say three hours away and learning more as far as queens, artificial insemination, right. things sure. like that. Yeah, the, well, the, the thing about all of this is um, we, have to, we have to develop a certain amount of competency first. Mm, right? Yeah. yeah we're, just because we have the training and the tools and equipment, we mm -hmm. are not going to be masters at this first year. And we are not mm -hmm. going to posture and say that we are. Mm -hmm. Just like with our beekeeping, it's a learning, it's an evolution of learning year after year after yeah. year after year. Mm -hmm. You know, So next year, 
Um, holler at me and let's see where we're at with this entire thing. Stay tuned to the, the yeah. Nature's Image Farm YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, it's an important step that we're making. It's not mm -hmm. going to be an, an easy step, but if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Isn't that the truth? So you're here to hear next year. So <laughs> I'm just yeah, we'll see it. We'll see you at the second <laughs> annual uh, uh, Creator Convergence yeah. at Nature's Image Farms. Wouldn't that be happens. something? Yeah, yeah, I hope I get. I hope I get the invite. It's yeah. been more than a pleasure. So yeah. so we wrap this up. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. Everything you you're doing here is amazing. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I, no I, I appreciate it as yeah, it is. You're so no, I appreciate everything you're doing here. So. Thank you. All right. Thanks.